This episode is brought to you by iconic Sydney beverage brand, Young Henry's. Young Henry's believe in community and bringing people together through art, music, skateboarding and surfing. They create live events, they collaborate, they support. So go and get yourself a Young Henry's and always drink responsibly. So wait up. So your, your beers create – the process is creating a byproduct of oxygen. Yes. Beer company releases beer, throws party with skate ramp, artists, DJ. You know, bop, bop, bop. All of a sudden you're like, hey, you know what? That's cool. Digital festivals kind of suck. It's almost time. Rock, 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 rock. Seven, six, five. Try to hold us. Hold us back. back to hold us. Hey, it's Shan here. This week I catch up with skateboarder, musician, entrepreneur, it's Mr. Oscar McMahon. Oscar joins me in the studio for a long story about his life so far. He talks about his early days growing up skateboarding on the streets of Newtown to then progressing to be the front man of the rock band, the Hell City Glamours, which was classic. And we do get some video footage of that up and I absolutely loved it. Oscar talks about his foray into building a very successful brand through Young Henry's with his partners. And he goes on to talk about his philosophies on what it means to build a brand and, and how they incorporated their their personal ethics, especially around building community. That was really interesting to me and uh, how they want to be innovative and remain independent, which they still are. I didn't actually know that. I thought they'd actually gone into a bit of a corporate realm, but they're very much independent and they're inspired and it's super fun and they love supporting art, they love supporting music, they love supporting skateboarding and surfing and that's what they've done over the years and literally put their money where their mouth is. And uh, it's not from a control perspective, it's just because they want to, you know, build the culture. So I really enjoyed this conversation. Go and check out the full video production on the Terrible Happy Talks YouTube channel. As we have been doing every week with that now, we have a featured artist of the week and this week's featured artist is Cindy Sin. So go and watch the episode and and check out Cindy's amazing artwork. It's such a pleasure and a big thanks to Steve Tierney for his art direction. So sit back, relax and get to know Mr. Oscar McMahon, everyone. Cheers. just in this in our sort of like friend group mm. because he used to play in a band as well yeah right and because he used to do the artwork for his old band i can't remember how we first did something i reckon he pitched an, an, a concept to us right he's like oh hey what do you reckon about this you know <laughs> like, what, what drew you to his art can you remember I think just it's it's like it's quite loud, brash, simple, impactful, you know, which is sort of um, <laughs> sounds like we're describing him as well. Is he like that? He, he's he is he's a classic. He is like I don't know, a bit of a Bart Simpson character in a way. He's just he's loud, he's funny, he's really like lovely, um, and he's just this wild art man, you know. He's a nut. He's he's out there, dude. He's great. Because it's iconic young Henry's now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look. It's, it's synonymous really. It is, you know, and we're, I think we're just so thankful to be, um, to have had like a really good relationship with, um, you know, an artist like that who's who has an iconic style, who does some really great work and does work for us but also does work for himself and for other bands and stuff. And they're like adjacent spheres, 
I don't know. It's really, um, it's, it's a very interesting thing to sort of unpack. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? Mm. Like, how important is it to you and the brand to support music and art? Is it like at your board meetings, is it like, where does it, where does it stand on the priorities? Well, I think that Young Henry's has always come into music and, and art as a fan and as a lover of it, but also like we see, we see people in creative industries as peers, you know, like we have a creative company, we make products um, and we actually believe in it. You know, why would you, why would you create a poster that just tells information when you have an opportunity to make something that looks great? You know, um, I don't know. Brands create things. Brands are all about making things that create a, or elicit a human response. Art is that's what art does, you know. That's what. That's the whole point, right? Why would you just create something and hope that someone opens it and the taste wins them over? You've got to do everything around it, and also, that's the opportunity. That's where the fun is, you know. Just, just releasing a beer is not that exciting. Beer company releases beer. Yeah, cool. Whatever. <laughs> that's what you're expected to do. Beer company releases beer, throws party with skate ramp artists, DJ. You know, bop, 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 all of a sudden, you're like, "Hey, you know what? That's cool. That's fun." You're also know, people get so stuck on like, uh, "I want our beers to be seen in a cultural place." It's like, well, you got to do something culturally relevant. You got to like, it's a fucking doing work, man. Get in there, get your hands dirty, and you know, if you. <laughs> You know, we've got an amazing network of creative, interesting people. So you start doing things with creative, interesting people, and guess what? More interesting, creative people come into your sphere and all of a sudden, you know, life is great and the brand starts getting the momentum, you know. It's really it's, it's the whole thing. How, how do you define success of the brand? That we're proud of it, that we've been able to grow authentically, that the brand principles are as respected and revered internally today as they were in the early days. In fact, maybe even more so today. So all of our brand custodians care about it, but we still push and pull. We want it to be engaged. And also we're trying to create an inclusive brand. So it's not about just us saying this is how it is. You know, you to collaborate with other people, to work with people in the hospitality industry or in bottle shops or working with bands and artists, you actually have to give up a little bit of power. Collaboration is about agreeing to something, agreeing to an outcome and working towards that outcome. And that's, you know, like that, that is giving up a little bit of your power, a little bit of control in some ways, but that's where magic happens, right? That's where you get to harness someone else's creativity, someone else's vision, someone else's database, yada, yada, and you actually can do something which is, you know, like one and one makes three in that regard. You can do something which is so much better than what you're able to do by yourself and, you know, like we're, we're, we're a small company in, in the scheme of things, like – you know, we're not even 1% of the beer market. Really? No way. It just feels like you're everywhere. You, you know what? You, we're probably in a lot of the places that you and your friends would go. And I, I feel that we've done a really good job in that regard. But, you know, you drive 30 k's in any direction, ask for a young Henry's and see what they say, you know. Mm. It's, not, it's not, always the, not always the case. Has there been the allure of going corporate? Oh, look, I don't really... I don't really look for a world where I'm working for someone else. I think our business partners sort of feel the same. I can't put a price on that. Well, look, there are our brand has been defined and created in an independent way. You can't you can't create a brand like Young Henry's from I think a corporate structure. Um, Interesting. I just think that our our nimbleness, our ability to fail and to try things and just you know for the first for the first 5 years we were really throwing things at the wall and seeing what stuck and we were having this amazing experience of what feels good. We don't have data. 
we don't, you know, we, we didn't have a defined marketplace. So we were like, well, what do you want to do? Yeah, I want to do that. What do you think? Yeah, cool. Let's do it. And as long as there was enough t- team buy-in, you know, written into our brand guidelines, it's like trust your gut. And that was guiding you? Yeah. Because the- if, if, if one of our business partners, say, let's say Dan, if Dan comes up with an idea and goes, oh, what do you reckon about this? And I go, oh, yeah, that's cool. Hang on. What if we did this? And then someone else goes, oh, yeah, actually we could. Once you start building that gut feel thing, you know, human response. Again, it's like, hey, if we all believe in it enough, A, it should be fun. We'll enjoy doing it. And B, if it doesn't work, we at least went into it with the right energy and perspective and we went into it to have fun. And so when it doesn't work, you go, do we enjoy it? Yeah, we did. And that's okay. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, what happens when it translates into monetary loss? Is that sting? Yeah, look, there's been a few stings. There's been a few stings. Um, but, uh, you know, bigger companies spend so much more money on drab marketing campaigns that any time that we've had a loss, it's actually been in the scale of things not that <laughs> not that huge, not like that cumbersome. And also, more often than not, a few people have had a really good time <laughs> on the way to that loss. So it's kind of like, like you know, like we put on our own music festival <laughs> so two, <laughs> two years. I think we were like, I don't know, three years old. Which one was that for those that called, don't know? It was called Small World Festival. Where so, was it at? Um, the first one we blocked off a street in Marrickville, Jabez Street, and we had about 2,000 people come down. So sick. It was rad. And then the next year we did it in City Park. So at the end of King Street, you know, put a – Big yeah. outdoor stage and all that. Yeah, we we lost quite a bit of money on that. But, you know, looking back, really, for we were this young upcoming brand in the inner west who put our money where our mouth is and put on a cultural festival where we invited musicians. Uh, we had 30 different artists doing live art. We had, I think it was about 12 different acts. We had three or four different local restaurants doing food. You know, it was this amazing cultural experience. It was really like inviting and we put our money where our mouth is. And, you know, like we've spent more money on heaps worse things, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like, and in the scheme of things, whether something like that is financially successful or not, it doesn't really matter because, I mean, yeah, it does matter. But it doesn't matter in the way that if you're building a brand, you've got to do real activity, real activity that someone actually – if you want someone to believe in your brand, you've got to be believable. Yeah, You know, you can't just stick your fucking name on something and stick it to a wall and go, hey, everyone believe in that. It's like – you I know, got a Google ad. Oh, yeah, yeah, that works. <laughs> No, but you know what? A Google ad, like, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting question. That's why I brought it up, actually. It's like Google ads, what they do is they're good for awareness. They are good to remind. They are good to capture someone. But when they come through, let's say someone sees a Google ad and they actually come through and look at you, you've got to have enough compelling activity that when they come through, they go, oh, actually, that is cool you are doing something interesting or you're an interesting, you know, you're not just, you know, putting some band on and you've only ever done it once and you're just trying to hook me through a Google campaign. You know, like Mm. I think that good marketing is when when it's actually in line with the core ethos of a brand. Yeah. Feeding the culture. Yeah. Mm. What's like culture, culture is not an act. Culture is a collection of acts, you know, and in the same way that a community, you can't open a business and say, we are about community. We want our community to support us. You actually have to understand that community. You actually have to walk the walk. You actually have to do things to support your community before they're going to come and support you. It's a, it's a give and take relationship. Dude, I really – I was saying this to someone the other day. I just feel like in this day and age people need to – in my opinion, I'm trying to work out it's not about what you can get, it's about what you can give. And I think 
people need to flip that script in their minds. I agree. It's always like, what can I get? What can I get? Like, what do you think about people who try to create a community solely through social media outlets? Has its place? You look at yeah. community is a really interesting thing that we get bogged down into. I guess the geography, but what? How we define a community is is a group of like minded people. You know, um, our main beer is called Newtowner, <laughs> but we sell it all over Australia now, and we actually like sort of had a bit of a a bit of a friction point when, you know, in the early days because for the first two years of Newtowner's life it, we only sold it in Newtown. That's the worst business strategy ever. <laughs> like you create this product that ends up being your biggest product and only sell it to like like people calling saying, hey, can we buy this beer? Like, no, nah, sorry. What, what what do you mean? Like, no, no, we, we can't sell it to you. You don't live in Newtown. Why are you trying to be like all exclusive? No, we couldn't make enough. Like, like elitist. Really legitimately. No, it sounds I, elitist. I, it sounds elitist, right? And then um, I think it was my <laughs> wife who once said to me, she goes, that's not very serve the people, is it? And we're like, oh, no, you're right. Is that one of your mottos? Serve yeah, the serve the Is people. Oh, yeah, I didn't even know. serve the people. The, the idea of um, we we we've had that as our company moniker um, since day one, and you know you can think about it a couple of different ways, but it it's a really nice reminder that your business only exists with the people that you're serving. You only you only exist if you are accurately reflecting. The changing tastes and the value system of your customers. And so when we were looking at taking Newtowner out of Newtown, we thought about, well, what is a community? Newtown is a community, but it is a community of like-minded people. Why do people live in a similar geography? Because they want to be surrounded by the same things, Mm. be that um, different cultural spheres or subcultures, live music, food, art, you know, like Newtown is an inclusive melting pot of all these creative things. And then you go, well, hang on, where else are there? Well, that sounds like Fitzroy, you know, in, in Melbourne, doesn't it? Like, oh, yeah, wow. And actually if you go to the West End in in Brisbane, like, oh, yeah, actually, then you start realising, well, a community is actually just like-mindedness. And then you start looking at your social media you know, community. And essentially that is a group of like-minded people that are not restricted by geography mm. who have an interest or enough of a uh, enough of an interest to be watching what you're doing and you're watching what they're doing. You know what I mean? So it is just like communities like-mindedness. As soon as we came to that realisation, we were able to sort of break free of our, I guess, geographic confines. And so... Uh, looping back to your question on building a community just digitally, I think while it is possible, I don't know if I don't know if it is as bedrock because in a digital age where there are so many conflicting platforms and messages and all this sort of stuff. Um, you'd have to be doing something really legitimate, really impactful to keep an audience for a long period of time. Right. Because they're just, they're getting fed other things as well. Mm. And, oh, hang on, I'm going to jump over here. It's not that I'm I'm not there, but I'm just less there because I'm now over here. Mm. Something else gets fed to you. You know, like what was the first 10 accounts that you followed on Instagram and how often do you still see them? Yeah, that's a good question. I Can't don't remember. know. No, no one does. <laughs> yeah. So the, the in real life stuff, I think people are craving it more than ever, you know, especially after the COVID lockdowns. Do you feel like it was part of the brand's mission to revitalise the music and art scene? Because I, I personally feel like I've seen you guys around a lot more after that. I was think, there a, a decision made there? I think that throughout COVID – we, everyone suffered throughout COVID, mm. you know. Um, we came out of that with a real um, a real drive towards trying to engage with live music venues, cultural spaces, trying to get people out of the house and engaging, you know. We, 
we live and die by hospitality. We love it. You know, we are fans of restaurants. We are fans of bars. We are fans of pubs. That's where our brand cut its teeth and that's where so many of our um, friends and collaborators, you know, live and operate. You know, it's a really – it's so fortunate, right? Dude. Um, and so I, I don't think it's our position to revitalise but it is our position to support and be fans of and to champion – those things, you know, right. um, because it, it needed it. And I think mm. what we're now in this really interesting space where you've got festivals falling over and you've got these younger people who have never had the opportunity of festival experiences. Which are life-changing. Which can be life-changing. Can be life-changing. Exactly. And then so you've got this effect of obviously – a whole bunch of different factors of as to why festivals aren't working at the moment, but a whole bunch of young people that don't know the value of festival experience is going to be a huge contributing factor. 100%. You know? Yeah. Digital festivals kind of suck. It's not, it's not the <laughs> it, same. It has to actually happen in the real world, It's got to be sweaty. It's got to smell. Exactly. It has to be. It has to be uncomfortable It has to times. be too cold and then too, too hot then too within hot. within 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have both of those experiences. <laughs> have you, look, I know we're talking a lot about business stuff. It's really intriguing. I, I've got to know though, okay, have you had corporate interest in the brand? Too personal? To a point. You don't want to say it now. Nah. Look, look, we, we, we have in the past, but it's never felt right. You know, we're pretty happy with where we're at. <laughs> you know. I, Good answer. I, yeah. It's <laughs> where, um, yeah, you can have more fun when you've got the keys. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you go, like as a leader, you're a leader of a company, like you're a founder. How do you go when you have to relinquish control at times? Personally, how do you manage that? There must be things that you don't like that other people in the in the brand are doing and you're like, oh, I'm just going to let them go. Well, for for anything to gain momentum, you need, you know, we're a team of 60-something people. No way. Yeah. like and, that's, and, you're, and you're still independent. Yeah. Dude. And you can't get 60 people running towards something if they don't feel equity and don't feel buy-in. And so what what that takes is you relinquishing control of certain things. Like, mm. uh, you know. Where do you learn, where have you learned these philosophies for, for other aspiring leaders? I know you're a, business, a businessman, but you're a leader effectively of people. Like where did you learn these philosophies? I reckon playing in a band oh. was the the most was the most formative thing. Is that because it's such a fragile dynamic? Um, you when you're playing in a band, you have to be creative, collaboratively. A song is only great when all four members, or five members, or six members, whatever mm. it is, um, are all as excited about the song and they're doing their best in it. Yeah. Your one like your one bit doesn't make the song. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> so it's this creative, collaborative thing. And the other part of it is that it's very rare, yeah, in my experience, I, our band never really had to make decisions based a, around large financial outcomes. Ah, uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. It's really healthy. So when you're in a band, your band has got, you know, let's say you're working on a record. It mm-hmm. needs an album cover. Your band name is a brand mark. Mm-hmm. And where you play and who you play with become events, brand statements. You start actually working on this brand of a band, how you look and dress and present yourself and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're all part of a brand statement. And that was the thing that I think, and this is only this is only hindsight that shows us this. Um, the co-founder Richard, he he used to play in a band as well, you know. And everyone's there are so many different bands that like make up Young Henrys. There are so many musicians, ex-musicians, and stuff really? like that. Yeah, heaps. It's hilarious. 
Um, you know, like so, so much annual leave gets used on touring, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Like it's, it's, it's super rad. Is it a melting pot of big egos? It, no, no, no. Have you, have you been, have you been selective there and, and very yeah, we, there's no place for it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, collaboration only you kind of got to check yourself to collaborate well. Um, <laughs> and that includes us, you know, like founders 100%, especially founders. Just because you were there on day one doesn't mean that on well, you're you know, setting the tone, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, sure, we get to set the tone that that's a privilege, but 12 years on, 13 years on, mm. I'm 42. You know, it doesn't mean that I know exactly what a twenty-five-year-old beer drinker wants anymore. Ooh. You know what I mean? So you've got to you've got to challenge yourself. That you know, it's great when you come up with the good ideas. Yeah, but also you don't want to be the person that has to come up with all the good ideas. Farm it out a bit. Yeah, let, let other people get. And you know what? That's where you get buy-in. They, and also, they like, buy-in. you get buy-in. You get. You get to hear these other ideas that you wouldn't have come up with. Yeah. So you don't have a, like a business degree at uni- from university or Definitely anything like that? not. No. No. I'm, Where'd you grow up? I grew up in uh, in Chatswood, then on the Central Coast, then in Forestville, and then after when we're living in Forestville. Um, my mum and dad said, you can pick which high school you want to go to. I didn't know which one I wanted to go to. And my mum said, oh, there's this high school in Newtown that's a performing arts high school. And I was like, all right, I'll go give that. You went to a performing arts high school? Yeah, yeah. So I went went and tried out and got into Newtown High School, the performing arts. For drama. I was going to say, not for music. No. I just assume music. And and it was funny. I had no experience in acting or anything at that point in time. Mm. Um, just, you know, year, year six kid doing a whatever trial it was and managed to get in. So I was like, yeah, I want to do that. So I caught like the a bus and two trains every day into Newtown from Forestville and that was like that's the sliding doors moment, right? Just I remember the first – day of year seven walking down king street just looking around going holy shit what is this place you know like punks and goths and you know people sleeping rough and like really heavy um like gay and lesbian population back then um it was amazing it was just this punk loud you know were you captivated so captivated kind of like a bit scared and outside of my comfort zone and all that and but it was it was amazing because you Newtown was also pretty rough back then yeah look it like was it, it has it has sort of become a little bit more sanitized compared um, to back in in what was that I'm talking were you talking like 90s yeah early 90s no, early 90s yeah yeah it was raw then dude. Yeah. yeah so it wasn't like this highly desirable area definitely not no definitely not and but what is great about Newtown is that yeah, I went to Newtown High School. I then ended up going to Enmore TAFE for a couple of years. What did you study? Um, event and entertainment design. Okay, I see yeah. that. Which, you know, Dude. Another, another thing which ended up being really like just learning the basics of design and the understanding of like design principles and, you know, I'm definitely not a designer. I can't operate Photoshop or Illustrator or anything like that. But... um. I can at least speak in enough design language that I can talk with our artists and designers, you know, and our, you know, brand manager and explain what I'm what I like, what I don't, what you know, and, and we can have really engaged conversations. So that that was helpful. But it was What yeah. kind of student were you academically? In high school patchy. Standard, you know, standard response. Oh uh, yeah, you know, Just, I was more interested in um Bongs and skateboarding and music and, you know, the... the bongs? Yeah. I thought you said bonds. I'm like, oh, what, you, you were buying bonds? Yeah, tra- bongs. trading bonds. <laughs> no, no. We're talking, we're talking Orchie bottle. Hey? Yeah, 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 yeah that's host. right. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I think, I think I did, I did okay yeah. just from, just from being, an ability to retain a bit of information and just do okay on the day, you know? Yeah. Which is, which is great. Did you enjoy like... The times when you had to perform as part of the curriculum? That was, that was the bit that – that was actually the bit that brought my marks up at the end of the day. Okay. 
I always did better at drama and um, I did okay at music and sometimes I did well at art. I did, I did okay at English and most of the other things I didn't do that well at. Interesting. But those creative things, you know, allowed yeah. me to get at like I, don't know, I think I got 75 you know, out of a hundred at the end of the at the end of the day, you know, Interesting. Like, it's all right. So, when did you get into skateboarding? How old were you? Oh, year seven. Yeah, nice. He, actually, there was this older guy called Rusty. He was the year above me, and he was selling a secondhand used skateboard for twenty five bucks. And I was like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, right. I, I, I totally want to buy that. And so, you can take it home tonight, have a bit of a go on it. And then if you want to come back tomorrow and give me 25 bucks, I'm like, no worries. And <laughs> I, I, that, that evening I'm going home on the, on the bus carrying this skateboard, probably carrying it by the trucks like a, you know, dog. Mall grab. And, mall grab. And, um, and this, this guy from this private school gets on the bus. He walks up, he just walks up to me and goes, that's a shit skateboard. <laughs> and I'm sure we're going, fuck off. <laughs> like, fuck off private school boy or something like that. Anyway, he ends up being my best mate. We <laughs> ended up like, his name's Archie and he, the guy that lived across the street from him, Robbie, the three of us became like this little skating crew. Yeah, that's And sick. then the, those three, uh, the, the, we started Hell City Glamours together as well. No shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so, so that's that Oh, because that was – I was going there like how did the Hell City Glamours get together? Yeah, it's just through – And the, you used the, to skate together. We used to skate together, no yeah. No shit. Yeah. Steve Tierney told me that you're like the full fresh kid skater guy, you know, kind of hip-hop influenced. Oh, no, that wouldn't – Would you have, say you're like a fresh kid? No, definitely no. not a fresh kid. I think – um we used to have a few kids in our crew that was that were fresh kids. We okay. were sort of more like the um, Iron Maiden, okay. Misfits, punk rock sort of kids. Were you? Yeah. Ah, interesting. Unless unless he's referring to- Was there ever to, a fresh period before you went sort of like rock? Do you know what? I reckon that maybe in the super early days, maybe I had a shorties T-shirt. Does right. that count? Yeah, they were fresh. <laughs> yeah. They were the kind of fresh guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But shorties were so popular back then. One hundred percent. So sick. But no, no, no. Like, like the the video that the video that changed our lives was Welcome to Hell. Dude, Toy Machine. Toy Machine. Amazing. That when that came out, and it was like we went and bought Black Sabbath records, Misfits records, Iron Maiden records. Just like watched that Jamie Thomas part, like. I don't know, every day. Yeah. Just psycho, psycho stuff. So groundbreaking. And you know what? Uh, one of the things that I've reflected on recently is that skateboard companies have actually always done brand really well in the way that they create they create a brand sort of tribal aesthetic. Okay. You know, like think about Think about old school, um, yeah, Toy Machine, Zero, Antihero, World Industries. There you go. You look at those different companies and you can look at their team, you can look at their decks, you can look at their hats, their T-shirts, you know, artwork, videos. They have a clear narrative. There's no mistaking, like that guy over there, he skates for <laughs> World Industries. Because you know? he's like fresh. T- totally. Yeah. John Cardiel, that is out of hero. Well, it used to be like the whole fresh versus hesh. Yeah, yeah. Like Hessian. 100%. Yeah. That's what, exactly. That's a really good thing because like it made up such a big part of your personal identity with what brands you were wearing. I mean, even still for me, you know. Absolutely. And like I'm someone that likes girl skateboards. Yeah. You know, so my jeans don't have rips in them. You the, know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying, you know. And I like fresh shoes with that board. Bands are sort of the same in the way that a, a band's crowd starts reflecting the image of the band. Yeah. You know, a lot of cultural and creative industries are like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our, like we've always sort of applied the same mentality to our beer company. Mm. You know, like just because it, it was just intuitive. It's like, well, you create merch that you want to wear and that other people in the company wants to wear 
And as long as you're doing something that it, that feels like you, you're actually going off on your own path and then you start seeing who that reacts with and all of a sudden you're defining this audience that, you know. How does that feel? It's it's amazing. Is it intoxicating? No, I don't think it's In intoxicating. Terms of like building of, the ego, like when you see people starting to dress like you. Well, not not dress like, but like engaging with the stuff that we create. You know, okay. um, I I think it 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 all it all feels precarious because it's you know. Did you know it then though, or did you think it was going to last forever? Really, honestly, <laughs> in the early days. <laughs> I, I didn't know how we were going to get through the like year to year. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? In the early days of Young Henry's, um, it was it was so non strategic. It was so gut feel, and just the industry was so new and exciting that we just we didn't know what to hope for and what to ask for. Interesting. So it was really it was a really exciting time. It felt like the gold rush a bit. Because it was just like we were just heading west into this new frontier, you know, and just sort of like moving towards the good energy, like absolutely. You know, I, I, my man, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got in my life was I had this friend of mine who was a real permaculture guru, really had a big influence on me, even though I'm not really that involved with permaculture anymore, and. He was just the most content, peaceful, wholesome guy I'd ever met. And I'm like, dude, how do you do life so well? He goes, do you surf? I was like, yeah. He goes, how do you propel yourself down the wave? And I said, well, you got to turn back towards where the wave's breaking. He's like, well, that's where the main energy is, isn't it? Isn't it? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, man, just keep turning back towards the good energy and it'll propel you forward. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, guru shit, dude. Yeah. But it stuck with me forever. I was like, that feels really good. I'm going to keep doing more of that. That doesn't make me feel good. I'm just going to not do that anymore. Yeah. It's kind of that simple in my opinion. It, it really is. Every time that there is a big fuck up in your life, I bet, I bet any money that there was a time on that path where you go, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. That that's my experience anyway. You yeah. you have this little but thing. You ignore it. Don't you? you ignore it. You're like <laughs> no, the prize we're going for is worth it. No, it doesn't feel right. No, just you know, ignore that, and then it blows up. Do you think as you evolve as a person and as a leader and as a businessman that that intuitive sense has become something that you're able to listen to more? Yeah, it's it's a muscle. Okay. You know, the more you the more you do it, the more that you. Um, the, the more that you, I guess, flex that and think about it but also test it out with other people, that's important. And testing it out with people that you trust their gut instinct and fostering a, a like a safe environment to say, hey, I've got a bit of a weird idea. Damn. Or, or they say, hey, I've got a bit of a weird idea. And then you go, yeah, yeah. As soon as you say it into the world and someone goes, oh, and – you're like, hang on, okay, we might be here somewhere. But the, one of the things that we've learned now is you never commit to anything long-term in a brainstorm, right? <laughs> okay. write, write down all of the great ideas. <laughs> Give it 24 hours and then go, all right, so are we, are we going to create a large two-story pink inflatable Young Henry's bar? No, okay, we're not. We were very excited about that the other day, but we're not. No, no, we're not. You know, like just, you, you've got to know when when you're in the room, you know, there can just be there can be false energy as well. You can just be like in okay. a mood and having fun and yeah. like, oh, I had coffees. Well, hey, actually, we had yeah. a beer and, you know. Um, it's, so it's almost like you've got to give yourself space to be creative, safe space for weird ideas yeah, and then you got to come back to Revisit. it. Revisit. Revisit. Man, I'd love to see your hiring process because like, it sounds like you've got some really good people with you. I mean, we got great people. What's your hiring process like? You know, like I'd love to see you interviewing someone for a job. Well, do you actually do that, or is that yeah, you, yeah. you have someone doing that for yeah, you? Yeah, you do the interviewing. We 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 will always interview. Um, one of the founders will always interview someone before they really. Start. Yep. Quick, pretend I'm being interviewed for it. Well, it depends on <laughs> it depends on the role, and it depends on. Um, on whether we will often do like second round or third round interviews. Oh, okay. 
And um, it, sometimes it's about – I don't want to give the game away, but – Don't give it away. It, sometimes we'll ask the people that have done the other interviews, what, what, are you, what, what do you think and what are you concerned about? And so we'll try to sort of actually go down a certain narrative, you know, um, just trying to sort of unpack it. But the other thing is the most important thing for us is someone that understands the brand and understands it to the point where they can talk about it because really we want Young Henry's to be a good experience for everyone. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. So if you meet someone from our delivery team, we want you to have a good experience there. Sales team, same. If you call our accounts team, we want that same positive experience, Mm. you know. Um, So it really is about finding good people without ego that actually believe in something, that they're they're there for more than just a career. Okay. And and maybe slightly connected to some culture. Definitely. Whether it's like art, music, skateboarding, surfing, just someone caring about something else. We try to hire interesting people. So if you find someone that has a bit of a side hustle, plays in a band, DJ on the weekend, runs an independent re- record label, I've got a sticker company. Yeah, they're bonuses. Absolutely. Really? Not like, are oh, you too busy for us? No, 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 no. Dude. It's like you've got hustle. You, you you care enough about something creative and interesting that you did it yourself. Dude, sorry, i just seen that art like Bar Beach Bolo. No way. <laughs> yeah. 100%. <laughs> 100%. It's everywhere. good, isn't it? Yeah. It's a rad bolo. There's a plug for How good are bolos? Yeah, I don't know. I had my 21st at a bolo, now a bowling club, and never oh. forget it. And I remember like schooners were still $2, you know, $2 a schooner, you know, not a midi, a schooner. And um, now, now it was a small place and I remember the word got out and it's just like, Shannon's having his 21st at the bolo. And like it was packed and then it got – and this was like, you know, I'm showing my age, but it was in the no, late, no, you know, 90s, so – there just wasn't the rules and the there wasn't the lockout rules and there was actually there was no bounces there. Yeah, yeah. You know, we just overtook this ball and I'll never forget they were still just we were just the biggest bunch of wankers, <laughs> drunk twenty one year olds. And they were just still so nice to us. You know, people are like walking all over the bowling greens with their shoes on, drunk and you know. Yeah, they were just so nice to us. I love I love the I love the reinvented bowler. What's the reinvented bowler? Well, there are there are quite a few bolos like Bangalo, Wambara, Bulleye, you know, Bar Beach, where the old bowling club model isn't reflecting the modern like, you know, community. And so they reinvent it. There's oh. lots of outdoor space. There's it's kid friendly. There's craft beer on. There's yeah. like they might have done some work in the kitchen. They might not have. You know, like <laughs> it's it's like I don't know, it's a really nice but you also have that culture clash of your old school rusted on locals who've been bowling there for 30 years i just think that's such a beautiful egalitarian australian experience like young families with their kids running around on one green mm. and the old the old fella drinking two he's old bowling on the other green you i know, just think that's that's you, awesome you know what you're right like you just got me thinking like it is one of the few places where young and old come together socially. Yeah. It doesn't really happen that often. There aren't that many places like, um, where you're you... not hanging out at nursing homes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. You know, it's it's a really and I think that's it's really it's really humbling. It's yeah. good. That's what that you're actually getting a bit of a sense of a um a whole community there. Yeah, dude. You know? Man, it's listen, hey, listen, I wanted to get some visuals up. Let's get some Hell City Glamours up. So okay. you were the right. front man Yo. of the Hell City Glamours where you started it with friends that you met through skateboarding in Newtown, dude. How rad. Yeah. Like like I got some clips from some of your, you know, gigs together and it was just so like rock. Like how would you describe your genre of music? Uh yeah, look, hard rock. <laughs> <laughs> Hard, hard rock, rock, hard rock, like, I don't know, little elements of like glam and blues and maybe metal as well. It was, but essentially it's a hard rock band. It was a lot of fun. A lot of, um, it was a real party band, especially early days. And we you driven by making good music or being rock stars who could party and pick up chicks? Sort of 
column A and B. <laughs> Thanks for being honest. Yeah, I mean, we we weren't the best musicians in the beginning. We got we got better, but we were never we were never great. It was all just like it was just like we're going to be a band, man. We're going to be a band. We're going to be a band. Like you said, like at some stages it started to really take off. Like, um, you know, in your early days, what kind of gigs were you getting? Just pub gigs around Newtown? Um, we early days was hilarious. We played at a Subi party at the Civic Hotel. Subi as in the clothing brand? <laughs> Dude, that's Our fancy. first ever Because that was a fancy brand. <laughs> Dude, 100%. They're like $100 T-shirts and oh, shit. Oh, mate. Yeah, that was the funniest thing. Um, and then, then we also played it like on the floor in front of a TAB at the Parkway Hotel. <laughs> like it was just all over the place. And then we just, when, when we started getting serious about it, we started playing the Hope Town and the Annandale and um, then it just started getting a bit of momentum. We started being able to you know, book a 200 capacity room and like, oh, hey, we sold that out and mm. got up to the point where we were able to play on a Friday or Saturday night at the Oxford Art Factory and we'd be selling it out. No. Um, you know, it was great. And then we started being able to do some tours with people like Alice Cooper and Paul Stanley and the Angels and Rose Tattoo and um, – Alice Cooper? Yeah. How did you get that? Yeah, I know, bizarre. Agent? Uh, no, back then we were, we were self-managed. Really? Yeah. So okay. most of the most of the time we were self managed. Interesting. It was yeah, it was. Um and then we got to got to go and do South by Southwest in Austin. In Austin, Texas. Yeah. No way. In 2009. Here we go. So you can we, actually look at the screen over here, Oscar. Yeah. Wow. So a lot of this stuff is so, is um shot on the So um, tell us about this clip. Uh this was a little doc mini documentary you made about the band on tour. Yeah, this is a, this is basically a film clip, but um this guy Benny Pitcher came with us on our South by Southwest um American tour. And so he's this footage is just us being around playing shows. It was um it was a lot of fun. And it was also that that was the tour where I realized that we weren't going to make it. What do you mean? I oh, just just you know, you go play in LA and New York and Austin. You know, we played with um, we played with the New York Dolls in Austin, which was like amazing. Dude. Um, and we had all these meetings. Like our record had come out in the UK and Europe mm. um, on this record label called Power Age Records, and we had a, a bunch of meetings lined up with people in in America for management and records and stuff and just none of them none of them landed and none of the shows were like that well attended and all that sort of stuff we just sort of came back heaps of great memories but broke and just had this realization it's like wow it's so probably how, not going to happen okay so how long had you been together up until that point about 10 years yeah about about that okay so aside from making good music you did share a collective idea that you were chasing the dream. Yeah. Okay. 100%. And like none of our jobs were like none of us were focused on our jobs. Right. It was like the band was the thing. You had a job so you could pay your rent. Right. So you, what sort of job did you have to um, back you well, up? Well, <laughs> at that stage I was working in bars. So um, I'm, I'm laughing. No, As you speak, laugh keep going. away. I'm looking at the footage. If you're listening, we have visuals of Oscar fronting the band as rock star as you can ever get, dude. <laughs> Doing a, like a mad guitar solo, kick in the air. Uh, look at that. you got people from the crowd on stage. Yeah, man. Is that a laneway festival? Yeah, that was that would have been Cherry Rock in, uh, in Melbourne. Yeah. Sorry, keep going back. So with your job to support your... Yeah, we're just working. Everyone just sort of like had a job to you know pay for your life and you know touring yeah. was touring was the thing like one year we did we did 50 something shows in a year which you know like if you do the maths on that you're in australia that means you're not in sydney a lot because you can't just keep playing the same same, yeah. same space you know um so yeah just casual bartending working in nightclubs and stuff like that okay. which ended up being super great because 
playing in a touring band. You get to meet heaps of people in, you know, live music venues. Working in hospitality, you get to meet heaps of people. Started really getting into beer, you know, when working in hospitality. And when after we came back from that tour of of the States and had that realisation like, well, we're not going to make it, in some ways that kind of opened up, I guess, opened me up to the opportunity that, well, hey, there might be something else. And when you're in the States and you're drinking all of this amazing like Sierra Nevada craft beer and, you know, and others, but Sierra Nevada really stuck out as a really important beer for me. And then coming back, working in a pub in Glebe and there's this guy sitting at the bar called Richard who we, I start talking to. We start, you know, chatting. He used to work in a brewery. You know, we start talking about beer, yada, yada. We start a beer appreciation club together. And then one night after beer club, Richard's like, how cool would it be to create a beer brand that's, you know, like – engaged with people like beer club is was like yeah man let's do it is that what it's actually called beer club it was called beer club (laughs) yeah and and that was that was essentially the moment and the next day i gave him a call and i said hey you know what we were talking about last night Mm. you know are you serious about that he's like yeah let's do it wow and that's what that's where the idea for young henry's came from interesting yeah late night drunk conversation was it, a, was it a hard day though for the band when you just went, okay, look, time to let it go? Did you have actually like a band meeting and go, look, yeah, we're just going to, we might just stop now? Yeah, we, yeah, we did. Was we, it that simple? It, no, it wasn't that simple. We were halfway through recording our second record and it was just a, a thing where we, we did have a band meeting at a pub. We all sat down, talked through it and... <laughs> Basically agreed, okay, we're going to finish the record, we're going to release the record and do an album release farewell tour. <laughs> That's a strange business model. Yeah, it's like I'm going to launch new music but then call it quits. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. fair enough. And so you know what, that was, that, that was cool though. That's like talk about going out on your own terms. Yeah. It was, it was great. It allowed us closure. We did, you know. So was it was it more of a like a relief or was it more a sad time? Like you lost something. Definitely felt like we'd lost something in some ways, but also I think it had run its course in in other ways. Yeah, gotcha. You know, like you just you knew it was expired. We, we yeah, but but like we'd been in the band for a bit over twelve years by the time we'd finished up. You know, 12 years in a touring band where you're rehearsing once or twice a week, mm. taking all your holidays to go do shows, you know, like being broke perennially. You know, like it's 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 a lot. It's like, you know, like a- amateur skateboarders. Dude, you know, same. like same thing, right? You just every, all Even pro of, skateboarders. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Um, but you get so much from it. You learn so much. You get so you get so many learnings. You you know, so many of our friends that weren't in bands, they they're like, oh, this is the Kentucky tour I went on, and we went to Thailand, and and it's like, oh wow, that's amazing. I never got to do that. And they're like, what did you do? And like, well, we went on tour and we did this, and we did, and we were here, and like, they're like, whoa, it's like you know, it's amazing, dude. You can't put a price on that. Exactly. It's also part of your legacy. I mean, just think of it, like your daughter. Is going to look at that one day and you're going to, be able to tell her those stories and that inspiration that she might find from it that, you know, you followed your heart and you chased a dream. Like, totally. So many people are too scared to do that, myself included. Well, and also that, and, and this is, this is probably a, an important learning for, for me. And I'm interested if this resonates for you as well. I at the after the band I felt I kind of felt a little bit frustrated because I thought we'd put in so much work so much work that the music industry deserved like that they should have given us a career and and I I think I felt a little bit frustrated for a moment but then I just we just came to this realization when we were recording the second record actually 
when we were finishing up that creativity is its own reward. Mm. If you get to be creative, whether you're making money from that or not, Dude. creativity is actually it, it's the pinnacle. If you get to practice that, then good on you. And so many people, we conflate the idea of I'm a creative person, therefore I need to have a creative job. It's like maybe you don't. Maybe you need a job and you have this creative thing over here which allows you to get up with a smile on your face every morning. You know what I mean? Because also like sometimes when creativity is your job, it fucking ruins the thing that you love. Dude, you know? Chris, my last guest, Chris Yo, founder of Amnesia Skateboard, said the exact same thing. Said um, by day software analyst, uh, analyst or software creator or something and then he has this creative outlet, you know, you know, finding artists to put graphics on his skateboards and, and he's been going for 30 years and, wow. he, and he even said that. He said if he had a – if the skateboard company was all that he did and it became his job – it may not have lasted. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's but really it interesting. feels like you've found the balance with your company now I've, where it's like creativity and a sustainable living, sustainable business that's supporting not just yourself but others, man. Absolutely. Amazing, dude. And um, it, it, gives, it gives me the ability to be connected to creativity. Um, my job isn't as creative as I would like it to be but I'm connected with our marketing team and our designers and our artists um, and I get to see creative output and I get to be in brainstorming sessions and I get to get to be attached to that. Really, it does scratch that um, creative itch for me but then you've got this the whole other side which is more the pragmatic, the business building and the um, strategy. This, yeah, the other side of the business which can be really taxing and can actually – you know, getting getting the balance right there is yeah. where one depletes your energy, and then I think the creativity is the is mm. the, the the carving back on the wave. You know, I think there's a lot. I think personally, there'd be creativity within that business side of things too, business strategy, and you know, there is there is an element of that definitely. For sure, yeah. you know, your you know projections are basically just you're you're hazarding a guess at what may happen in the future. It's 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 madness dude i can imagine you know and so the to structure a business and try to forecast where we need to go you know um when you're creating a strategy for a business you need to think about it commercially how many people do we need how many products do you need to release which products are we going to focus on what you know it's it's problem solving but it also takes some left of center sort of thought and it's really interesting that the creative side of Young Henry's, you know, whether we're talking with our brew team about a product or with our marketing team or design team around, you know, an event or art, that is just, that's creative conversation. The business structure and forward motion part, you need an accountant in the room you need someone with a business background. You need like weirdos like us as well to be coming at it from a different sphere and really that that friction. Do those types hate you though? Sometimes? No, 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 because it, it becomes a creative process. Okay. They're okay. leading into it with they're leading into it with their superpower and it becomes collaborative and all of a sudden they're getting as much enjoyment out of it as we are because they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to forecast that out and if we do that, well, hang on, what are we going to do to, you know, it's problem solving collaboratively. Yeah. And, you know, it is actually a really enjoyable thing. It's stressful as well. Dude, I would love for you to come and speak to some uh, year 12 high school students that I teach because I have really good conversations with them about life, you know. When a kid gets to that age, there's a lot of confusion and loss, like what do I do? And the first thing I say to them, and I'm sure their parents hate me for saying this, I'm like, you got a dream? Like, you know, you want to be a you want to be like a famous musician or skater or artist, chase that first. You know? Yeah. But I also believe in nurturing entrepreneurship. Like you've got a business idea, like chase that. Like don't work for someone else. Mm. I think there's too much of a mentality in our Australian culture that you must be a worker drone. Yeah. You know, like I th- and I feel like you're a really great example of an entrepreneur who's just done it with your, with your co-founder obviously but created it by what you want and not being dictated 
mm. by others. I think there's something really special to that. There, there is, and you know, I think I feel very privileged to um, to have been a part of Young Henry's in the early days, and that we have always attracted solid, talented people to fill in our weak spots and to pr- propel us forward with the same sort of energy, like. Our team bring in much energy as we do every day. It's amazing. They like, like they like their job. They love it. You know, like people people believe in it. People Dude. people turn up. And they they're like, hey, do you know what? We should be doing this. Well, even down to the warehouse storming. Absolutely. Is that because they get free beer? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> is that a problem? It's not not a problem. No. It's like um, okay. Like this is a serious question. Is like. Is there a negative drinking culture amongst your workers? No, I don't think there is a negative drinking culture. We have had people over the years that have had problems, but um, but if we had a if we were an investment firm, we would have people with substance abuse problems as well. You know, that's a that's a human issue. Mm. Um, I've seen the Wolf of Wall Street, man. There you go. I know what happens there. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, <laughs> we're a lot, lot better behaved than that. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. But um, the, I think the other, the other part of it is what, what is interesting is that in, in a modern context, I think people are less considering um, employment as just being a linear thing. Yeah, you know, you go to you go to school, you go to university, you study that thing, then you get a job in that thing, and you do that, and then you die. Mm. Like it is a lot less like that. But all of those little building blocks that you learn along the way, it's so interesting that um, what I learned in science, I would never have thought that biology. And science is actually something that I'd be, you know, having daily conversations about. Well, can we can we talk about this? And Jock, can you get up the sustainability award? Can we lead into that? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, dude. Like I love that. Yeah. I love that Young Henry's is B Corp certified. So for those that are unaware, what does a B Corp certification mean so for a business? B Corp is a. It's essentially a, a an international movement of businesses and. B Corp is it's a certification and it's essentially a structure, right? Yeah. So any business can go and go through the vetting process to become B Corp certified. You have to do quite a bit of work. You have to change the um, right wording of the constitution of your company and you have to adhere to uh, a continual improvement program where you actually get audited every three years. Gotcha. So it's a lot of work. And it's, it's quite tricky. But essentially what B Corp does is it creates a really good framework for people who are interested in improving their businesses, you know, and that is down to your customers, your supply chain, your uh, employee experience, you know, corporate governance, transparency, like all these different things which um, I think make a more ethical um, a more ethical business, that is sort of the structure of B Corp. And sustainability is a big component of that, correct? Yeah, that's so right. So sustainable manufacturing practices? Yeah. Yeah, and this is what I want to lead into. You talked about science. I'm, I'm a, I am know there's a, a deep science in actual beer brewing. Yeah. Which I'm not very clued into. But can you talk to us about the algae process? Yeah. What yeah. does this mean? Okay. It's so interesting. So... All right, beer, beer is made from malted barley grains. Check. Check. You <laughs> <laughs> sometimes from Czechoslovakia. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. No, beer is, beer is made from malted barley grains. You add them to water and you add hops. The hops is a, an acidic flower, creates bitterness and aroma, you know. You then add a live culture, which is yeast, brewer's yeast, mm. and that eats the sugars from the malted barley grains. It ferments, creates alcohol, and it farts out CO2. Gotcha. So all brewers around the world are creating CO2 from the fermentation 
of these multiparty grades, right? That's a very simplistic view. No, it's good. It's educational. Most people don't know that. Jock, did you know that? Yes. My he like. Okay. All right. Go. Sorry. If you actually grow barley, that the, does sometimes end up in beer. There, there you go. go. And, you, and you like beer, don't you, Jock? I am a very, very enthusiastic fan of beer. Okay. I love that. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. So so we've always tried to, you know, we've got two community-owned solar farms on, on the roof of our brewery. Um, we were the first people to, to sign a 100% keg rental agreement so that we could halve our keg miles. Um, we've got a high-efficiency brewing brew, brewing system so that we use um, – less malt, less water, less power, all this sort of stuff. So we've always tried to do um, things in as sustainable way as possible. A little while ago, about six years ago, we met some of the scientists at UTS from this particular area of UTS called the Climate Change Cluster where they're researching microalgae. And basically um, Richard, our co-founder, found it really amazing when hearing about microalgae. They're like, well, you know, microalgae is a microorganism that lives in a liquid environment that eats sugar and uses that to photosynthesize and create oxygen. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, it's like the opposite of brew's yeast. Brew's yeast eats sugar, uses that to ferment and releases CO2. Like, okay, hang on a second. Sorry. Microalgae eats CO2, uses it to photosynthesize and turns that into oxygen. That's the opposite. So wait up. So your, your beers create, the process is creating a byproduct of oxygen. Yes. So, so we now have a system in our brewery that captures all the CO2 from our fermentation. We then have a tank of algae. We feed that CO2 through the algae. The algae eats the CO2, photosynthesizes, and turns that into oxygen. And that's being released just into the air. Yeah. Okay. But so how was – sorry to cut you there, but how was the CO2 being released prior to that, just into the air as yeah, well? Yeah, just like venting into the, into the air. Okay. Yeah. So most breweries around the world – That's what they do. They do. Okay. That's what they do. They just vent CO2 into the atmosphere. So we're now capturing, capturing that, feeding it through algae, turning it into oxygen. But – Malted barley grains is our main waste product. And ever since day one, we've been donating our what's called spent grain, like once you've used it, we donate it to farmers for livestock feed. And when we put in this system, we started thinking, well, hang on, if we're going to be creating all this algae, decarbonizing our our fermentation, we're going to be caught with all of this algae. What are we going to do with it? talking to the scientists and they're like, well, you know, you, it can be used as animal feed. And we're like, well, we're already donating all this grain to animal feed. So we started researching um, researching the methagenesis or the demethagenesis properties of microalgae and we now have got a worldwide patent on this process and we're looking for the optimum strain, basically – we want brewers around the world to put in one of these systems, stop purchasing CO2, stop releasing CO2, release oxygen instead, create microalgae that you add to your spent grain. You can sell that to livestock farmers and help them reduce their methane emissions by about 40%. No way. So imagine that, like two waste products that has – sorry, a waste product in microalgae that has decarbonized your – fermentation, yeah, adding that to another waste product in spent grain and then shipping that to a different industry and helping them to decarbonize. Dude. So it's this really interesting thing of these two industries that already work together because, you know, agricultural, agricultural industry creates barley grains. They come into breweries. We then use them and then it goes back as livestock feed. So you get this really amazing cyclical thing. <laughs> so yeah, we're um, we're nerding out pretty hard, and we're actually trying to create a business completely based around the algae proposition, where our where our customers will actually be other brewers, trying to get them to install these systems. Yeah, so for another brewer to adapt to their processes, yeah. 
what is it a big capital investment for them to change their processes? It, it depends there, on what. Because that's always a reluctance, right? Absolutely. So it will be for some for some brewers. Some of the major ones definitely not. Some people are already going to have some of the equipment. So it's really going to be a case by case by basis. But have, have people been receptive to it though? A lot of people are very interested in the idea. Yeah. How far along in this journey are you then? Six years. We've been funding this. But you've been doing those processes as a as a company yourself for six years. No, we've had or our system installed how? for about two years. Okay. And we're just optimizing it. You know, we're still in commercial trials basically. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry to jump in. So, but are you yeah. already um, delivering some of that stuff to the livestock? Like is, is that whole workflow already in place? Yeah, yeah. We are um, – we well, we're still in the testing phase, right? So we've just done a an a hundred day live animal feed trial with the Queensland Animal Science Precinct, um, basically to make sure that it is healthy for the animals, that they continue eating, putting on weight, their gut fermentation and microbiome isn't affected, and um, essentially that they like it. And it's been really positive. All of the results so far say that it's good for the animals. They they want to eat it, and um, and they're putting on weight. So amazing, yeah. dude! That's like just really inspiring and groundbreaking. And I'm going to be monitoring that journey closely. It's a pretty weirdo thing, but why is it weird? Why do you say weirdo? Well. For a beer that, company to... That's how change occurs. Of course. But I, I, I mean weirdo in a good way. In that For sure. It's like I remember having that first conversation with Richard and he's like, well, yeah, we could we could possibly, you know, put in this tank of algae and and we were like, oh, yeah, let's do that. Let's, how are we going to fund it? I don't know. Let's, let's work it out. We So we pulled some money out of our marketing budget and, inst- and started the, the testing. I mean, are these some of the luxuries though of having somewhat of a successful brand where, you know, you're not scrimping and scrounging for every last dollar? I don't, I mean, I don't want to pry, but when you are you at that level where you, you have a bit more freedom to explore? We did when we started that. Um, the last few years have really, have really knocked our industry around Why? a lot. Why oh. do you think? Uh, COVID, um, COVID, you know, having the hospitality industry closed down essentially for two years, you know. Um, it's insane to think about really. It really is. I, I mean, it's like it's like the trauma of just forgotten it. I think a lot of people have just forgotten that that happened. 100%. Do you reckon? 100%. Yeah, listen, man, like so interesting. Like thanks for sharing all that. Um, I want to I want to just move on. I actually want to kind of say like, Viewing you and your brand from afar, I want to say like a thank you for supporting skateboarding over the years because I know for a fact you've kept you've kept a lot, some skate careers going. You know, uh, it's it's been really amazing. Like you know, because I am more of a skateboarding podcast, I guess, and and I know that because of you and supporting events and supporting some brands like Volcom, for example, like you know, in such what is like such a niche little activity, you know. For someone like you to believe in it, it's pretty amazing. Like even today, like I'm recording this afternoon with George Richards and Amy Massey and, yeah. you know, they're ambassadors for the brand and, and, you know, you've, you know, you've supported them. So thank you, man. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure actually. And, you know, it's really funny to think that um, me and Shane Azar used to skate together when we were kids. And you know, now we work together on like on events. We've been working with Volcom for um, I don't know a f- few years now, throwing parties and doing things together, which is mm. which is super rad. And I don't know. I think the the skate community is it. it I mean, look, it feels really familiar. It feels like the music community in in a way as well. You know, creative interesting people who are bound by a passion for something and it's not necessarily driven by, you know, remuneration or finance. It's actually Mm. just people who believe in something. And also um, 
you know when you're at the skate park and you feel you feel a part of something and you know you, you might be just starting out but you land a trick that you've been working at and one of the older guys is like well done you know and it's like that doesn't happen in other spheres no. you know and whereas in the music community as well when you are starting out sometimes the you know the more established bands they actually turn up early they they watch your gig hey that was cool man that was great you know that sort of they become these really interesting i guess self fulfilling building um industries because there is that fostering of young talent yeah. and support for young talent and you see that absolutely and i just think that that's mm. that that gets lost in business so does much does it okay i th- i think it i think it does you know mm. there comes a time in 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 so many businesses where you've just got to focus on um, especially through tough times you've got to focus on just like what is core business and that's why the the brand part of a business is always so important and is so much more exciting because that's where you actually go it's not about the balance sheet this is actually about you got to do shit that people give a shit about so what's that going to be? Let's stick a mini ramp on Sydney Harbour. Let's stick a band on in the backyard of the stain. You know, like let's let's do some things that are going to psych people out. Dude, it's just amazing to hear you say that. Like just to say it's not about the balance sheet. Like it's so refreshing to hear. Well, nothing inspirational has ever come from a balance sheet. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Who, who reads it? Who reads a spreadsheet and gets inspired? Like that doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't happen. You know, inspiration has to come from mm-hmm. other other places. The balance sheet and the spreadsheet is a very important part. Don't don't get me wrong. I get it. I get it. But it's not. It's not where. It's not where momentum comes from, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I was curious about how the collab with Volcom came about, but do you think it was through your relationship with Shane Azar? Do you know what? Um, the first thing that we did together, they were doing the Pink Hotel. Um, they were doing a, a, an event at the Pink Hotel years ago up in Coolangatta. Mm. And um, I got a call from Shane. He's like, Ozzy, mate, we're, we're doing this thing. And I saw that there's this young Henry and he's I just realised it was you. And I was like, yeah, man. He's like, well, do you, you want to like come and, you know, just chuck some beers at this this event? Like yeah. it'll be super easy, you know. And um, so we did that. It was a great thing and we just really enjoyed working together and enjoyed re- reconnecting and our teams get along and all that sort of stuff. So it just, it just turned into this really rad thing and so sick. I think we've done a couple of things a year since then with Volcom. Did I a noticed. beer together, a bunch of parties. It's so real good. cool. Have you got have you got an image up of um, one of the skaters? So we've got a few skaters like he like Rob Pace. Yeah, he's, he's an ambassador. Yeah, I he's mean, a legend, that man. That guy skates so good. He's from the Central Coast as yeah. well. But I mean, you know, do you, like how do you come across these people? Are you just recommended, or are you just following the industry as well a little bit? I think that there's a couple of people in our marketing crew who are like, yeah. um, especially our brand manager. He's like right, right into it. His name's yeah. Clint Ossington, yeah. um, and we, you know, through. I think through our connection with Amy Massey, we met George as well. You know, Bobby was on the radar and I think we met him through one of the Volcom events. It's all just been quite, um, it's all been quite organic and um, which I know seems like a trite thing to say, but, you know, they're all, they're all really good people. They are. You know, it's funny you mentioned about like people putting their, passion and their body on the line for no reward like i look i'm looking at rob pace he was nominated for skater of the year and he he put out this video part that was so mind-blowing like some of the handrails he did but some serious like death risk in what he was doing (laughs) you know and for at the time probably making like no money i heard he's still like doing his welding job on the central coast yeah that's right but it's it's again it's much, much more than monetary value. It's it's legacy. It's pushing a personal boundary. It's creating. It's inspiring. And, you know, again, like we do get wrapped up in, in money and, yeah, I just don't think you put a value on it. So good one. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I think what you can do things to the, – there are two balances that you need, right? One is your bank balance and one is your soul balance for, you know, whatever the fuck that is. 
But you're kind of like sometimes I know people who have got a great bank balance and they don't have anything that keeps up their soul balance. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) They are not happier than people that have low bank balances and a full soul balance. You know, like if, you know, like playing in a touring rock band when you're young, (laughs) you're happy as a pig in shit, broke as all hell all the time, but it doesn't matter. Did it get get sometimes I like, was there some hard partying that could have brought you undone? Yeah, yeah. How did you avoid going to the deep, dark depths of that? Because you seem like you came out of it unscathed. Well, some people don't. Yeah, yeah, some people don't. I think we were always a pretty good crew. There were definitely some um, – there were, there were some pretty dark times for a couple of us at different times and we always – I think we managed to keep each other – honest and we had a really good work ethic Mm. and work ethic is really important because you anyone that leans too far into partying it affects their work ethic if you're rehearsing twice a week you know we would do a six-hour rehearsal on saturday every week you know you you turn up with a hangover after the first hour or two you're not hung over anymore you've sweated it out okay you know like um and so just we were, we were, man, we were so hard about like you had to be there for rehearsals. You, we never missed a gig, all that sort of stuff. And that keeps you that keeps you on the straight and narrow to a point. Like, yeah, sure, there's heaps of partying and heaps of other stuff, but you, you're there for sound check. You load in your own gear. You're at rehearsals. You're like, like, who's like. So in a way it sort of kept you, yeah, the deadlines and the responsibility sort of. Just stopped you. Yeah, yeah. interesting. And don't, and don't be a prick. Don't make someone else carry your, your shit into the venue, don't man. Don't be a prick. Don't be a prick. I heard you say that somewhere else. <laughs> don't be a dickhead. <laughs> don't be a dick. Yeah, and I had no. another guest say it just like he's overriding philosophy. He's like, just don't be a dick. Yeah. You know, because like, you know, I think you could be a dick if you wanted. Yeah, if you wanted to you be. You know, you've got, you've got everything you want in life, don't you? You know, most I'm things, sure. all, the, all the checker box things you've done. But you're, you're pretty nice. Like we had some tech difficulties and, you know, you didn't once complain. We've got no dicks written on the wall at the brewery. Is that in your interview process? <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's actually one of our brand statements. <laughs> what, don't be a dick or no dicks? No dicks. Yeah. No dicks. <laughs> it's just simple. It's just simple. It doesn't, you know, like good manners don't cost anything, That's you know, true. that sort of thing. Like it's true. You can get so much further in life being friendly and actually engaged with people mm. than to walk around just worried about your own agenda with your head stuck up your ass. How do you approach uncomfortable conversations though? You must have to have them with employees sometimes. Well, you, you have to you you have to um, approach all conversations in a balanced way, you know, whether it is um, – whether it's with an employee or a business partner or a um, or a customer, you know, mm. if a customer isn't paying their bills, you know, do you call uh, call and get aggressive, and or do you call and say, "Hey, are you all right? How are things? You know, is everything okay? Do you need any assistance? You know, if they're not paying your bills, chances are they're not paying a couple of other bills. Maybe they're having a hard time. Hey, just split up with my <sighs> partner. I, you know, I'm like, okay, cool. All right. Could we work on a way of maybe getting this sorted? Yeah, of course. I just, can you give me some time? Yep. You tell me the dates, we'll work it out. You know, if amazing messages to put out there. It's just Oscar. about being, trying to be solutions focused. If you think about, it, it, and this is a really, really tricky thing, I think, to be um, to be really consistent with. And I, I think I'm talking personally there. Um, is going into something saying, "What is my desired outcome?" And so, taking the heat out of it, and actually trying to work towards that outcome. And if you collaborate with someone, and you you know you be a bit vulnerable or ask them how they are you actually have a much better chance of getting there than going in and going, 20 days, you got 20 days, you know, like <laughs> just. Dude, these are beautiful messages that I think a lot of people need to hear. There's a distinct lack of, you know, empathy or tolerance of other people. 
you know, and you're right. Like generally there's an underlying issue but we just see this what's on the surface and like damn, if you scratch the surface like every time. And again, like relating my experiences as a school teacher, I see it with kids all the time. Like I definitely I look past the outside behaviours now. Huh. And then when you when you scratch a layer or two deeper, it's like, yeah, I didn't have breakfast this morning because mum and dad had no food, you know, or they were fighting all night last night and I didn't sleep so because it was too noisy or I had to sleep outside because dad was, you know, being aggressive. You know, like things like that and and just, oh, it's everything just – and all of a sudden it just strips back those layers and compassion is developed mm. and I think that's what we lack in our society right now. I agree with that. But it, it does come as a byproduct of – and I heard you and Jock talking about it earlier – People are under a lot of financial strain right now, mm. after, you know, post what's happened in the world and inflation is is the high, is through the roof, you know, and people are just not making ends meet and it's translating and I think I love that you're spreading those sort of messages of compassion. So right on, brother. Thank you. Business karma, man. It's a real thing. Is that another one of your brand statements? No, it should be though. <laughs> <laughs> Business karma, like, you know, you Treat others how you want to be treated, you know. I don't know if I've always listened. If I was a, a budding entrepreneur listening to you, like I'd be like, okay, these are all the. In my opinion, this is the ingredients of your success. You've just shared it with everyone. Hmm. Do you know that? Oh, didn't know that. I think these are the ingredients. Like it's, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> That's how it feels. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it. It. Those different ideas, they allow us to be consistent in a in a way of consistent brand messaging and consistent, you know, way of doing business. It allows for – it allows people to contribute and it allows um, – it's almost like your business strategy has to be set around values first because that's the that is the only thing that will actually have continuation through fluctuations of markets and people coming and going and all that sort of stuff. You actually need to have a set of values that is core to your business. Mm. And then everything else like your yearly strategy and all that sort of stuff like you for, you'll forget about last year's strategy and the one before that. It's like it doesn't doesn't matter, but those core principles that has to apply the whole way through. That's the that's the tricky thing. Yes, dude. Yeah. You gotta live and breathe them as well, which is tough. Yeah. You don't look like a businessman though. No, I don't. Like, feel I'd love like to one. see you turn up to some sort of like board meeting, corporate board meeting. <laughs> you know, with your distributors. Do you ever turn up and everyone's wearing a suit and then you just turn up as yeah. Oscar? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's rad, dude. Yeah. I yeah, I got invited to a um I won't mention the thing, but it was some um, Basically, a, a room full of um, CEOs and directors. It was about three hundred people, and I was the only person that looked like me. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at that, dude, Theo Von. Did you sponsor Theo Von? A uh, Theo Von uh, tour? No, no, that's that's just. Oh, a, that's his art. That's just a Cindy piece. So Cindy's yeah. art, and I love his art. It's beautiful. Well, listen, it's been so epic, man. How are you feeling? It's been a bit of a long afternoon. It's been good. It's been, been really great good. hanging with you. Been nice chatting with you. I know, dude. Even, you know, earlier on uh, before because we did have a bit of a delay, but thanks for your patience. Mate, thank you. Do you um, is there anything you want to end on? Is there, have, we, have we covered everything? Feeling pretty good? Oh. I'm feeling I'm feeling feeling really good. I feel like okay. there was there was like didn't miss anything? No, there was some really great little moments and it all sort of flowed. But that algae stuff, dude, is insane. Yeah, that's that's um See that's permaculture. It's like permaculture the philosophies of permaculture is cyclic as a cyclic culture as opposed to monoculture. Yes. And that's really what it is. Yeah. It's a form of it. You know, it's getting a waste product and repurposing it or upcycling it in mm. some way. It's but super like sounds just super scientific and tech. It's sort like it sort of is scientific and tech, but also it's a really funny thing that you think about a cow in a field goes down to the river and drinks water and there's algae in the water. Mm. So animals are finding the solution in nature anyway. It's about 
how do you find those mm. little things in the world and apply them to industrial practices? Yeah, dude. That's the that, that's what I find really like. And then that cow craps in the field and then on a full moon, magic mushrooms grow out of that crap. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. Well, because they're, well, they're algae. Mushrooms are a form of algae. They're right? fungi. They're fungi. fungi. Yeah, are fungi. they related to algae? Um, fungi and algae are different but similar. Okay. I believe. Interesting. Because there's microalgae and macroalgae, macroalgae being seaweed. Gotcha. Yeah. You know mm. that microalgae and macroalgae are responsible for 50% of the world's oxygen. No shit. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. Yeah, trees are only 50%. The rest really? of it is seaweed and algae, yeah. Dude, I had no idea. Yeah, isn't that it's, mind-blowing? It's, it is mind-blowing, the whole, the whole concept of it. You guys are kind of like beer nerds, hey? We are full fucking it's nerds. That's rad. <laughs> Like when you when you and your like I know we're going to wrap it up in a minute, but when you and your co-founder Rich is it? Yeah, Richard and Dan. Richard, Richard. Yeah, yeah, got together and started the beer club. Yeah, you know, like what kind of discussions were you having around flavors and things like that? Like, were you really just getting into the the nitty gritty of the smells, the the flavors, the textures, all that stuff? So that would have been two thousand and ten. Yeah, and so we were. Back then you couldn't go into a pub and get a craft beer or an independent craft beer very easily. No. You know, you might have been able to get a Cooper's. All right. And so Beer Club was just about we were pulling in beers from different parts of Australia, different parts around the world, Belgian, Flemish, American, and it was just a conversation with whoever turned up. Everyone would taste it and talk about it. What are you tasting here? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? You know, we did like stout and cheese matching night and all this sort of stuff. And really it was just, it was this thing that because of the access to craft beer was not available, a lot of people would start turning up because they were really interested. And what was really funny is that beer club started really small, ended up having about 120 members and... Oh, I can't remember the number, but I feel like over 10 of the people from from initial beer club ended up working in the beer industry. <laughs> it was this really cool little Dude, time of our lives. To be, man. Yeah, Gosh. it really was. It was it's great. like a magic little time. Yeah, wow. you know, pull people together and yeah. see what happens. Dude, I love those stories. I love hearing that. So, so good. I wanted to talk about your gold teeth, but we don't have to. We already talked about that. I love <laughs> yeah. that. They sue you. They look rad. I was actually looking at it going, I fucking want to get a gold tooth. Yeah, yeah. Dude. Gold teeth, man. They're the way forward. It's a little bit gangster. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> does it make any difference to how you, like, can you feel it? Does it hurt? No. Like, it's just normal. Oh, I think I've had them. How long you had them? 20 years. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Tw- Tastes more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can just rip through steak with these bad boys. <laughs> yeah, I love him, man. Sucha. He's such a character and such an absolute gem of a human. And thanks for being on the show. And uh, yeah, Mr. Oscar McMahon, everyone. Mm-hmm.